Have you ever felt lost without a recipe or envious that some cooks can conjure a meal out of thin air or an empty refrigerator? (laughs) That's the question chef Samin Nosrat asks at the beginning of her cookbook on the four elements central to cooking. Elements, which she says, not only makes food taste great, but makes great cooks. Those four elements are salt, fat, acid, and heat. Learn how to use these elements, she suggests, and you'll discover what your, she'll dis, you'll discover yourself improvising more and more, more confident in what items you can see and purchase at a farmer's market without a recipe to guide you so that you can create and enjoy. With the knowledge of salt, fat, acid, and heat, you can not only be a good cook, but a great one. Far be it from me to disagree with Samin Nosrat, but the element of desire is also important. In order to cook a nice meal, one has to want to cook a nice meal, value a nice meal, and appreciate the delight which comes from the creativity of food. If your approach to food, no shaming here, is just something to put in your stomach to stop the hunger, if food is a means to an end, then if you don't enjoy cooking, then no amount of knowledge about salt, fat, acid, and heat will produce the results that you and others desire. It takes a recognition that we don't just need to be fed, we need to be fulfilled. When Jesus is telling the disciples that they are salt, he's not just comparing them to a spice for food. He's not even singling out individuals. The you pronoun he uses isn't you as in you individually. It's a collective you, like Jesus is saying, (laughs) y'all. Y'all aren't salt and light on your own. You're salt and light when you participate and belong within a community committed to being salt. The you, as in an individual, becomes fulfilled only when you become part of something which accomplishes a relationship that transforms you into something greater. I think that Jesus uses this comparison to claim we disciples, we, y'all, are essential to a finished product, to the creation of something meant to fulfill God's great desire for all humanity. Salt is seasoning to enhance flavor, and if it's not enhancing the flavor of food, then it's useless. Food, Samin Nusrat suggests, isn't meant to be salty. It should be salted. Jesus is now turning from a sermon centered on who and what blessing looks like, which we heard in the Beatitudes last week, to a vision of how he and his disciples will fulfill those blessings by creating the kingdom of God. It's about giving us, that y'all, a sense of identity, which makes who we are and what we do elements of the overall good. You are salt. You are light. Jesus says, y'all, my disciples, have an extended covenant, like the one Moses made with God, which goes beyond just a relationship between you and God. It's an obligation for you to be with one another. That is the formation of mission, to be salt and light, which shapes the environment, the world that we live in. That's what the disciples are asked to be, and to do, to create, to create a world real, with realized possibility. For a chef, the result is a meal worthy of admiration and praise. For a disciple, the, the result is a world set right, with people gathered together, for wounds to be healed, trust restored, and gifts and talents to be used. That's what it means to be salt and light to make the world salted, not salty. 
It means healing, forgiving, reconciling, and sharing. It means going beyond who's in and who's out, who's contributing and who's not, who's worth more than whom. It means we know what we're doing when we do it and what the result should look like, even if we don't get it quite right. It means we work together, each in our own way, to roll up our sleeves and commit ourselves to a finished product. That's what fulfillment means. We've made the Christian life a private, specialist pursuit. What we should be doing is sharing the moral vision of what a flourishing society and flourishing humanity looks like. As we continued to turn inwards for salvation to come into each individual's heart, we lost the narrative and drama of how God came to participate in life for all people, not just the ones who attend a weekend conference or workshop to do some aspect of private devotion better. The reconciliation of God and God's people of God's creation isn't a private personal pursuit, but the subject of why Jesus came to be with us in the first place. It wasn't to fix our bad behavior. And if you've ever read any of the Old Testament, you'll know that God abandoned that project long ago. (laughs) God came to draw us closer in love, to form relationship in the most intimate way possible to walk alongside one another, to eat meals together, to touch someone's wounds and listen to their cries of longing and isolation, which each of us carry. God came to remind us who God is and in that who we can be. When we think of those prophets of old cursing the sins of the people, The two primary complaints time and time again are, you people have forgotten God, substituting other objects or things for God, and you have forgotten that you have a responsibility to care for your neighbor, especially your most vulnerable neighbor. So don't muck it up again. (laughs) But we do muck it up again. And so God comes to us not to smite us or to wag a finger in our faces and say what a disappointment and failure and how bad we've turned out. He comes so that we can see in word and in deed, in action and example, what God has been trying to get us to realize all this long time. That's what fulfilling the scriptures means. God isn't distant God hasn't forgotten. God didn't abandon us just because things are hard. God fulfills all those moments when we feel the full weight of loss, when we wear our guilt and regret like a coat, and when our grief makes it difficult just to get up out of the bed. So it's only right that this kingdom Jesus has come to inaugurate will need us, our ability to help and form relationships because of the example of his life. We long for new experiences, for exciting moments, and for fulfilling lives. And yet the deepest experiences and the most transformative moments come when we connect ourselves with someone else's need. We're bored and frustrated when our lives lack a sense of purpose or a vocation for which we're well suited. To live as a person fully alive isn't to find some special place or object which will make all our problems go away. Life comes when we can learn from others, when we stop trying to acquire more and more and let ourselves name where we most connect with someone else's hunger, with someone else's loss, with someone else's persecution, and when someone else is told they're the problem. Knowledge itself isn't enough. Whatever theological insight we think is crucial, whatever rules or systems we put in place to guide those we think need our guidance, none of that is as important as loving your neighbor, listening to your neighbor, and allowing your neighbor's experience to inform you 
rather than you think you're saving them. People can be helped in many different ways. Sometimes all a person needs is to be taken seriously. Whether you cook well or not, think of all that salt can do. Consider fresh cucumbers topped with creamy feta, a bowl of pasta cacio e pepe, or a brownie sprinkled with flaky sea salt. Salt can take ordinary foods and make them extraordinary experiences by what it brings out of what's already there. Layer the salt throughout the cooking process and you'll be rewarded with a dish so flavorful. But it takes attentiveness to the dish as a whole project, not one moment's casual toss of salt. And just a little salt, used sparingly, can do so much. We're asked to be more important than an ingredient in a recipe. We're asked not to lose what we are in our nature and what we could be when our nature is connected with other ingredients. Salt isn't all there is, but it's important, vital to what we're trying to produce with God's help. Jesus tells us that all we've been given in the law and the prophets is fulfilled. It's fulfilled, trustworthy, true, certain and sure because of God in Christ and God working through us. There were many ingredients already present when the time came for the disciples to be the necessary salt. What God has given and what God has done before is not being replaced, simply being added to. There are layers upon layers in this creation of God, and we're but a part a significant elemental part. Samin Nozrat writes, the three basic decisions involving salt are when, how much, and in what form. How you answer these questions will set out your plan for a meal. With experience, knowledge, trial and error, with a willingness to use our imaginations and improvise when necessary, we can discover a wonderful experience and the time of our lives spent in what we can provide for our friends. It's not a feast if you're eating it all alone. 